welcome to our lecture series for the for really two entities tonight, uh, three actually, um, uh, the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Tech, uh, University of Detroit Mercy, uh, the School of Architecture, represented tonight by their Dean Will Wittig. Did, Will, hold up your hand. There he is, way in the back. Uh, former Dean Steve Vogel, N faculty, students, uh, all welcome, and uh, thank you for co-sponsoring, and we look for many more co-sponsorship opportunities with you in the future. And the Detroit Regional Chapter of USGBC, who is also a co-sponsor of this event, and thank you very much, USGBC, and you all are in the back as well. Why is it that the sponsors always sit in the back? I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, just a point, another announcement is that uh, for those of you that uh, require uh, AIA continuing education credit, there is a podium outside that you can sign up for. Even if you don't know your number, it's okay. Uh, once they enter your name, your number will pop up. But if you, if you do know your number, uh, it's good to verify it that way so someone else doesn't get your credit. It's true. <laughs> So we are very pleased tonight to have as our speaker Doug Farr, AIA Lead AP. And Doug Farr is the founding principal of the architecture and urban design firm Farr Associates. Based in Chicago, the firm is widely regarded as one of the most sustainability-oriented practices in the country, recently certifying its sixth lead platinum building. Doug was the founding chair of the USGBC's Lead for Neighborhood Development, otherwise known as Lead ND Core Committee. This is the interdisciplinary group of professionals that created this first ever rating system for sustainable land development. Launching in 2009, Lead ND integrates smart growth, walkability, and green building practices into standards and metrics that scale up the sustainability to a neighborhood level. Based on his firm's pioneering sustainable design practice and his insights gained from chairing LEED ND, Doug authored the urban planning uh, best-selling book, Sustain Sustainable Urbanism, Urban Design with Nature, in 2008. So please, without further ado, welcome our speaker tonight, Doug Farr. Thank you, Dean Leroy. Good evening, everybody. How we doing? Great. All right. So who's a student? All right. Hands down. All right. Who's a teacher? Practitioner? Uh, architect? Planner, USGBC member, lead accredited professional, member of CNU, Congress for New Urbanism. Anybody? None? Okay. Uh, what did I forget? Engineer. Engineer. Okay. Okay. The engineer called out the engineer. We'll grant one or two more special interest call outs like that. How about former deans? <laughs> yeah, right. Right, okay. All right, well, it's a good, thank you for coming. It's a good group. It's really an honor to be here. This is a homecoming. I'm a Detroit boy. Did I write, press the right button here? Is that working? Is that what you want? <laughs> Should it go red or not? Red. Red. Like that? Yes, sir. Okay. So you want to kill this one? Thank you. Anyway, great to be here. Homecoming, um, Castec boy, um, University of Michigan grad, and uh, really the things I have to talk about tonight are have their roots in Detroit and my upbringing here. I like to say to people I grew up on the east side, took the 75 Russell bus down to the 51 Hamilton bus and transferred to Castec and then climbed to my drafting class on the eighth floor, if you can believe that, cl climbed the stairs every morning uh, to learn how to use a a sharpener, people of a certain age remember that, you had to do sort of sand every piece of lead you use and your hands were always sort of black and dirty. It was back in the old days before CAD, what's CAD? I don't know what that is. But, uh, but anyway, so a lot of the things you're going to hear about today are uh, closely related. So um, this is the book, you know, it's for sale on Amazon. I don't have any to sell tonight, but um, it is one of, the, one of the things that we'll be talking about. So sustainable urbanism, yes, if you could close the doors, I'd love that. 
because there's a cleaning crew that's really about to <laughs> assault us, I think. Um, so sustainable urbanism is, at its core, this idea that um, it's time to scale up sustainability, that the green building movement I credit in the United States and frankly internationally with, with putting a focus and a technical rigor to the issue of sustainability. Uh, and green buildings, as you'll see, are hugely important in our world. Um, and then there's an opportunity yet to build on that and to scale up uh, to the next level. So here we go. So sustainability, we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, I've had the pleasure of having some just really sweet things I got involved in in my, in my professional life that brought me into contact with all sorts of groups. Um, you know, the green building folk, the smart growth folk, the brownfield folk, the energy efficiency folk, the, the, the rainwater people, et cetera, et cetera. And it tends to be the case, and this is human nature, that you approach a big problem one little piece at a time. So the picture you see here is one of silos, and the suggestion being that a lot of people approach even huge comprehensive things through little narrow specialties. And it's a natural thing to happen, uh, but I think it's the thing we probably have to work hardest to overcome. And so if you take away one theme, it is that, that we need, do need to work at an interdisciplinary level, at a higher level of integration. And I think some of the tools I'll be talking about, I hope, make it sort of obvious how you might do that. But as I said, the conversation about sustainability tends to focus on specialty items. And so here are three. Um, again, if you read the media, you would think that, that sustainability was about objects. It was about the complex fluorescent bulb, arguably now the LED bulb the Prius, arguably now the electric vehicle, uh, and then the green building, now maybe the platinum building or the living, living future, the net zero building. But the idea being that sustainability is about efficiency of objects. It is not about our lives, it's not about how we organize ourselves and so on. It's these narrow things. And there's this interesting uh, phenomenon called Jevons paradox, which if you, you, know, you can Google it, but I'll tell you, basically it's the idea that as things become more efficient, we consume more of them. Makes sense, right? It's cheaper. So the person that invented, and this is a, you know, a homegrown specialty here in Detroit, the better car, the more efficient car, the more fuel efficient car, the lighter car, that we think then reduces our demand for oil from countries that hate us. Uh, what happens with, when it gets in the hands of humans? Sometimes that means they buy a house that's three or five miles further away from their job because it doesn't cost any more to live further away, right? So Jevons paradox. So the cafe standards that have been enacted um, are, are accompanied by a study that proves that with those higher fuel efficiency standards, we'll actually drive 5% more miles. So anyway, you can't get there through efficiency alone. Right? And this idea of you know, starting small, medium, large, and the sustainability discussion often trails off at the scale of the building. People aren't sure what to say or what to do at a scale larger than a building. And LEED, you know, I'm a USGBC member since the 20th century. <laughs> we joined in 1999, so I've been you know, at this a long, long while, as, as have my friends. Um, so I totally drank the Kool-Aid, continued to drank the Kool-Aid. We're on our, about to certify our seventh platinum building. We, that may be the global leader, but there's a friendly competition. Who cares, right? We're all doing great work. So, and we all know LEED. Um, what I'd like to talk about, though, is the history of LEED and sort of where it came from. LEED, the term was coined in 1996 by Rob Watson, and it spells out what it spells out. But the, the thing to know about LEED is that it started out with the premise that the way to solve the world's environmental problems was one building project at a time, one building on a lot at a time. And so LEED went out and, you know, conquered, arguably conquered many markets and, and the world uh, um, by doing that. And it's a, so it's a good thing. Um, and I should probably not show this one, but just suffice it to say that you can get a great building. This is a wonderful building, a lead platinum building, but look at its context. It has no spillover benefit. You know, it's a parking, it's parking lots, it's diverse, it's uh, concrete and asphalt uh, on an unwalkable street. And so the standalone lead building isn't necessarily solving all the world's problems. And you'll get phenomenon like this one. This is, um, this is a town of West Brazos, Texas. You probably have the means to point at it. Excuse me. Is that it? Whatever. Is, is there a pointer coming on? No. Oh, thank you. Turn it on. 
There we go. Okay, so this is the town of West Brazos, Texas. It's sort of south of Houston. And there was an existing uh, small town elementary school. You can visualize one as, I think it was two stories tall on one block in the city, no parking lot, students, teachers, everybody walked to school. So what happened? The uh, town got the bright idea of making a new green building. So green school, excuse me, replacing this one. Where did they put it? Out on the, oops, I'm sorry out on the highway, down here. So they moved it from in town, no parking lot, walk to situation, three miles out of town on a highway, and get, make it a LEED certified school, right? So this got no plaque, this got a plaque. <clears throat> one of the features that the new school claimed as one of its environmental achievements was that it was filtering the stormwater that ran off its new parking lots. <laughs> when ironically, the old school didn't have any parking lots because everybody could walk there. So. Obviously, one building at a time without taking into account where the thing is and whether it's building a community or a city or not is, is not going to get us there. And this is, this is a cheap shot joke slide. Please laugh. Right. So this is not actually a lead anything, right? It is just an eye trick, right? But, but it does raise this question, you know, could this be LEED certified, right? Of course it could, absolutely. But what questions would LEED ask about the absurd escalator heading up to the health club, right? It would ask, you know, is the escalator efficient? It would ask, you know, is the, is the stainless steel on the panels recycled or virgin, right? But it would, can't ask the obvious question is, what the hell are you thinking, right? That's just a crazy thing to do, right? So again, LEED was written by human beings. It's you know, necessarily imperfect by that definition, but it is the best thing we have to just throw your, throw your heart and soul into it and use it, but recognize its limits. There are the things that LEED, LEED doesn't uh, take on that are, are arguably crushing national issues right now. This is uh, the obesity maps. If you've never seen them, you can go on the Centers for Disease Control website, just do obesity maps, PowerPoint, boom, and they'll spit, spit out for you by year an animation that will make your, you know, Make, make you unhappy. <laughs> but here we go. This is 1985. You can see the, the scale on the map is uh, 10, less than 10% obese, 10 to 14% obese. And how are we doing in Michigan? We are no data. Well, that's, that was a pretty sweet spot to be in 1985. So fast forward 2010, and the country has gone you know, from blue to red, and red in this case is not political persuasion so much as weight. So this is you know, 30 pounds overweight for a five foot four frame. So you know, vast stretches of the country are more than 30% obese, right? We pay for this in healthcare costs, we pay for this in limited quality of life for people, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, it's a declared by the Centers for Disease Control a public health epidemic of the first order. The built environment is implicated in it. It's not the full answer. Clearly soft drinks, fast food, et cetera, diet. But our physical inactivity that we of the places we design and occupy can have a lot to do, it, do with it. And so this is a quote from the book that comes from the National Institutes of Health. Over the next few decades, life expectancy can be expected to decline by as much as five years. Right? So as a species, you're pretty good if your life expectancy is going up and something's going wrong if it goes the other way. So we Americans you know, have done that. So, and here's the other sort of statistic. 250 to 400,000 premature deaths, deaths due to lifestyle factors. So uh, number of people killed in fires in the United States annually, any guess? 5,000. So this is on the high, high end 80 times more of those fires, half of them are cars, half of them are buildings. So when you design a building, you know, and the, the fire marshal leans on you to make sure that the fire stair uh, conveys people safely out of a building in the case of a fire, but makes it unattractive to climb the stairs, he's addressing the 1% problem, not the 100% problem. So anyway, there's an interesting disconnect. And then we get these sorts of anomalies. This is, now, this is less about lead, but it is some, a little bit about how all of the building metric uh, sustainability systems measure things. So this is just, these are charts of the average size of the American household. This is 1940. 
to 2000, so you can see it's gone down a little bit, it makes sense. Um, the average size of the American home has gone up more than doubled in 60 years. And you know, this is not a bad thing necessarily. This means we're wealthier. This means we have more choices. Uh, you know, so there's, uh, you know, there's a downside to it, but I'm, I'm not here to say, you know, goodness, you know, progress is a bad thing. But here you do get, end up with these sort of effects, right? The average per capita, per person size of a house back then was 260 square feet, it's now 800 square feet, right? So you get these anomalies in, in ASHRAE that is referenced by LEED. ASHRAE is the, the heating and cooling standard, to simplify it, where the efficiency of a building is measured per square foot. So Bill Gates has a house that's about 40,000 square feet. My house is about 2,000 square feet, and by ASHRAE, Bill Gates' house is more efficient than mine because it's measured per square foot. And so it, there's a runaway aspect to the way we're measuring things that reveals to me that we haven't even turned around to confront you know, the issues facing us. So I think, I hope that this presentation is clear in that point. And then there's, there's this assertion that when you travel the world and you know, arguably the country, but certainly the world, that um, in the United States we value quantity over quality arguably, and so we like a lot of stuff. So here was a quote that happened actually the day after uh, election day on NPR, and it sort of just struck me as amazing. So this is a guy named Sean, what's his name? Sean Durkin built a 4,000 square foot house in Charlotte, North Carolina, wanted solar panels, but he gave up when he learned that it would cost $40,000 more. We'd love to have the panels if we could afford it, now, this is, if we could afford it, is stated by Sean Durkin, who just built himself a 4,000 square foot house, <laughs> who somehow can't get together the scratch to put some solar panels on it. Um, and then, you know, rationalizes this by saying, well, you know, the return on investment, cash on cash, uh, you know, is a 20 or 25 year payback, a true statement. But what's interesting to me is, look at the math here. If Sean Durkin had built himself a 3,600 square foot house, I think he'd been able to afford the solar panels. And actually, we'd, he wouldn't have needed $40,000 worth of solar panels. He would have needed $36,000 worth of solar panels. So it's the smaller the house, proportionally the smaller the investment in renewables, et cetera. So, but this is not just this guy, who I'm sure is a great guy. I have nothing against Sean, but this is us. This is kind of what our society values, is we'd much rather have the 4,000 square foot house and slough off as we can't afford that other stuff. So anyway, that's the country, that's sort of the shape of things, so enough about that. So Far Associates were in Chicago, uh, in the Manadnock building, if you've ever been to Chicago or read the history of Chicago skyscrapers, it's a great old building, six foot thick bearing wall. Uh, um, basically bearing wall structure. Uh, and we have you know, a little firm with attitude. So we ha take the cop this attitude that implementing sustainable urbanism from room to region where every increment of architecture aspires and planning aspires to perfect the city. So we are about city building in increments. And so I hope to show you some uh, examples of that. So first thing is just, you know, we're, we're celebrating our 21st year this year uh, in business and I'm just going to show you kind of the origins of what got us to why we have these attitudes and why we do what we do. So back in 1993, if you can visualize that, that was a long time ago, we got asked by a bunch of community groups to become involved in planning, a planning project. This is a corridor, transit corridor from Oak Park, Illinois on the left to the Loop in Chicago there. So it was then called the Lake Street L. It's now been, it was years ago renamed the Green Line, uh, CTA Green Line, and it visited and stopped in this neighborhood called West Garfield Park. So in 1993, the concept, the terms transit-oriented development was brand new. It came from California, from a book written by Peter Calthorpe. Ironically, it was based on how the, the streetcar and transit suburbs of Chicago and Cleveland and New York and Philadelphia had been done in the late 19th century. So it was re-importing into Chicago something Chicago essentially helped create, right? So we learned how to draw circles and there were several students we met with this afternoon who were drawing circles, right? So it's the first thing you do in TOD is you draw a circle, you debate the size of the circle, you make sure the circle is centered on the station and so on. But we came up with this, you know, what we called a prototypical uh, TOD for 
Lake and Pulaski, and we called it, in 1993, we called it the sustainable kit of parts. These are the sort of elements of land use that you want to have around. We thought they were universal. You wanted to have all of these around uh, every CTA station or every transit station, arguably. So 1993, we really got lucky. Our clients, pro bono, uh, CTA threatened to tear this line down. You know, it was an eight, eight mile line. It had served this neighborhood for this community for a hundred years. CTA said, we're gonna tear it down. And our little plan, kind of uh, naive as it was, was successfully used to win the politics of fighting the money to fix the thing. So $350 million later, that was really cool. So we had a little victory. Chicago was gonna tear down its infrastructure and we helped contribute to it. So that was uh, 1993 Far Associates early kind of win. So at the same time, I, you know, growing up in Detroit, I was really interested in cities and city revitalization and also uh, the car industry taught me to be really interested in energy and energy efficiency and, and green things. So in the 90s, we were trying to get green clients and we just couldn't do it. People would meet us and we'd, I was chair of the Committee on the Environment at AIA and they, we'd meet people, potential clients, who'd say, you know, uh, tell me what your vision is for this environmental thing. I'd say, well, you know, I think it's energy efficient and it's a couple other things. And they would interview all the people who were my friends on the committee and we would all tell them different things. One would say, I think it's about stormwater. One would say, I think it's about efficient, ener efficient material, or healthy materials. I think it's about good indoor air quality. And the clients were so confused, we never got any clients. With one exception, this is the Smith, Smith couple, which was a 10,000 square foot house. Oh my God, I'm aghast at it by now. Uh, but they were a mixed couple. He flew for American, she flew for United. So they were both pilots, right? So uh, a mixed couple. That's big in the airline. You know, who, who are you married to? Oh my God, you know. So anyway, but here it was, a solar house, R35 walls, geothermal. Uh, you know, early kind of trying to get all the packages together, but you know, fledgling practice, trying to get off the ground, uh, and so on. But, but anyway, so, so finally, so so the, hold that thought. Fast forward on the TOD I showed you a minute ago. Five years later, we got re hired by the, the neighborhood to do a more uh, refined TOD plan for that station. So here, here was the form it took at the time. It was, this in the foreground is that elevated train that goes from Chicago to Oak Park. You can see here there's a U-shaped uh, series of multi-story buildings wrapped around a park. This is the supermarket, the it would have been the first supermarket for about a four, four square mile area. High disinvestment, no services, no goods, all that sort of stuff, housing, shops, jobs, etc. And so this is our vision for TOD. And in 1998, we thought of this as a really sustainable project. And it was about brownfield reuse, transit ridership, densifying the city, adding missing goods and services to a neighborhood that hadn't had them uh, in 50 years and so on. So highly sustainable. The next year, in 1999, we finally broke through. And by broke through, broke through, I mean our little committee on the environment made contact with then Mayor Daly's staff and convinced them to commission a LEED certified building, 1999, called the Chicago Center for Green Technology. Uh, and it was when we undertook it, there were no LEED platinum, there were no LEED anythings really, um, but there were no LEED platinum buildings at the time. So, but when we sold it to the mayor, he said, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it platinum, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts, we got a project. And so my friends and I, Far Associates took the lead, my friends and I uh, worked on designing this building. Again, a very highly sustainable project, we thought, on the desk next to the previous project, right? So TOD, highly sustainable, um, uh, LEED certified building, highly sustainable, and you can see all the elements, right? Vegetated roof, rooftop of solar panels. This is a uh, uh, the retention basin that uh, filters all the stormwater off the site. We put our geothermal heating and cooling system under it. Um, you know, really cool stuff, right? And you get here's the south. It was a 50, 1952 building we reused. We did not build new, so that's also sustainable. The greenest building is one that already exists, and we put solar panels on the south facade and they're angled such that the sun penetrates in the winter when you want it and doesn't in the summer when you don't. As I said, we put the geothermal field under the um, uh, stormwater basin because the heat transfer is most efficient in saturated soil, so we call that integrated design. Both of these are integrated design elements. Um, we stopped calling this uh, what I'd called it all my life, which was a ditch. We started calling it a bioswale, and that ama 
raised your friends. That was kind of fun. So, but anyway, so CCGT, highly sustainable, but the aha moment was there was no overlap, none at all, with the TOD project I showed you a minute ago. So that was about brownfield, transit ridership, density, mix of uses. This is about the things that LEED was about, and LEED wasn't about any of those things. This became the third platinum building in the world, and it was the first LEED platinum to have public transit. And that said something to me about the values of LEED, that you could easily get platinum without it, right? So we went back and re-rendered that first drawing I showed you a minute ago. First of all, we went and bought brighter colored markers. That was like a big move. <laughs> We must have made some money that year, I can't remember. But anyway, so get out of the drabs, we're into the brights here. So, but you can see also the ideas of CCGT are literally like, like oil on canvas draped on the old plan. So now our rooftop looks like a CCG, CCGT rooftop, vegetated roof, uh, green bling in the form of PV and solar hot water panels and so on. And then the park, there it sits, but has been rethought as an instrument of common infrastructure. What do I mean by that? The vision here was that these buildings would not have their own heating and cooling systems, but there would be a central one housed in a greenhouse in the park, pipes underground, etc., geothermal uh, shafts or wells, however you characterize them, in the park, and the park would filter the stormwater, water would flow from the street into the park, and charge the groundwater and saturate the soil to make the heat transfer more efficient. And the premise was this would be owned by an ESCO. Each building would be cheaper to build. You don't have to have a mechanical system. You just contract for energy long term. So that was the vision. And oh my god, were we, gosh darn it, uh, really excited, right? So at that point though, this is 1999, we had a thing, an idea, which we, did, what did we call, we had a different name for it, but this was essentially what, it, what became sustainable urbanism. Walkable transit served urbanism integrated with high performance buildings and high performance infrastructure. And so you can see it's that, it's not the standalone building, it is a place. It is a place containing green buildings that then are reliant on some sort of high performance infrastructure. So all these systems are working together. If you're a firm that's a design firm, you can see transit service, that might be a transit, transit planner or an urban planner might be involved. Obviously high performance buildings is architects and mechanical engineers. High performance infrastructure are involving the civil engineers, the utility companies. So to fulfill this grand vision of integration requires a lot of players and a lot of cooperation. Uh, something that frankly doesn't happen really uh, much, much in routine practice. So, 1999, we were convinced we had solved it, right? So, we, we, we got hired by uh, the RTA to prepare a TOD plan for South Suburban Orland Park. And here's the plan, and it was a pretty good plan. This is the train tracks. There's a, a four-story hotel building we were putting uh, with the train station in the lobby. Streets that provide good sight lines and access. The streets are stormwater streets. We've added the uh, green bling to the buildings, turned the drawing into our transit client, or transit-oriented client. And they said, love the plan, but all that green stuff, we didn't ask for it, it's confusing, please take it away, right? It's like, goodness, you know, they didn't like it. And so what we ended up doing here was um, uh, turning this into a black and white drawing. And tur <laughs> turning it in, because you, you really can't tell, really can't tell. So, um, so here, 46th and Hiawatha, again, 1999, we're on the road show, you know, going to prove the world that we really know what we're talking about. So another green TOD, 46th and Hiawatha. And this was a hell of a fight about density. Neighbors don't like density. They wanted a town center or a transit village center here. Maximum, when we started the process, one and a half stories, right? That is not a, tr a town center at one and a half stories. So we fought, fought, fought. The community worked and prevailed and ended up with a four-story mixed-use town center, which is a very good answer for this, for this place. But I asked the question, if all the buildings in this, this plan were green, could they be one story taller? And every, room in the hand, every hand in the room in 1999 went up. People didn't know, there wasn't lead, there wasn't green building, it was just this idea of urbanism and density was made more appealing and for a developer more profitable if it was paired with green. And so that, we felt like, aha, we're on to sort of something here, something's going on, right? And then we, again, 1999, uh, showed up in normal Illinois. 
and uh, these guys are absolute troopers and heroes and everything. So we came up with this, this plan for, um, this is the Amtrak line that goes to Chicago here, St. Louis there. And there was a whole jumble of streets. We proposed a circular uh, resolution of all these, sort of the geometry of the spokes of the streets, uh, and then uh, a series of buildings around it. In 2002, the town of Normal, Illinois, and when, when that's your name, as a town, you have to try harder. You really do. <laughs> so in, in 1999, they voted to become the first municipality in the United States to require private sector lead buildings. Normal Illinois. So run through your mind. Like who would you guess would be first? It'd be like Berkeley or Boulder or Austin or something like that. No, Normal Illinois. So these are incredible leaders that stepped forward uh, to do this. And so here you have it. Our, we're finally drilling down on this idea of the stormwater park. You saw it in the Bethel plan, you saw it in the other plans, and we're getting closer. We've sort of sold them on the idea that that circular intersection can be a really cool uh, uh, place to gather and that we can gather the rainwater off the streets and filter it and have it be a fun uh, uh, and positive amenity. So. To deliver this kind of space, we had to figure out how to do something called write a form-based code. If you haven't heard about that, uh, look it up. But basically, I think of it as like a reverse cake mold. You put over the top of a building lot, and it defines for you the surfaces that your building must touch. Right? But anyway, so we've, we delivered that rotunda, that cylinder of space, uh, that way. The first building was designed by a local architect fulfilled the, not, it's not an award winner, it's not a Starkitect building, but it fulfills what we needed it to do. An arcade, it's the minimum height, it has uh, the materials and proportions we were after. So here's that circle, this was just finished in 2010, and there you have it. The landscape architect for this highly award winning, Peter Lindsay Shout, uh, deserves a lot of credit for his just master, mastery of design from the curb, you know, sort of across the circle. R gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous facility. If you're in the vicinity, go check it out. And you get this sort of scene going on. And I have to go back and say, this design broke more rules than any other project we've been involved in. What were the rules it broke? First off, traffic engineers believe human beings should not occupy the center of a circle like this. Why? Because they have a notion that the higher and better use for that land is something called a safe zone, or a free zone, I can't remember what it's called, which is there for the driver that might be approaching the intersection and loses control or falls asleep and needs some feet to come to a still safe stop. That's the purpose why people cannot occupy them. So we had a hell of a fight. People have heard me all day. Get the mayor on your side. So we got the mayor on our side. And we uh, fought for two years to get this approved. And the final resolution was we tried to get it approved as a round, it's called a roundabout. That's the formal engineering name. We had it approved as a circular intersection. And what's brilliant about this, there is no such thing as a circular intersection. So <laughs> consequently, <clears throat> Consequently, there are no rules governing them, and we, so there are no rules we can't have broken any, and so they looked at, well, we got no objections, so, you know, there it was approved. But, so that was, you know, a big set of, uh, 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 you know, rules broken. Uh, here's another one. If you've designed any sort of public space with water in it, the guidance by lawyers and the profession is don't make standing water deeper than a quarter of an inch, because it's perceived as a drowning hazard. So. Here are children not drowning. <laughs> um, so what we all did as kids, it's now in the kind of litigious world we're in, it's called not drowning. The expectation is eventually that you will, right? So, but un you know, unfortunately for the lawyers, the kids are just having a great time and the parents are egging them on. And then you really know you've sort of gotten it. You've gotten it. Uh, you know, a lot of the work we do around the country is working with cities that don't have an ocean or don't have a mountain range or don't have the civic opera. That they're trying to compete for talent, like the people in this room who have the freedom to be, to locate a lot of places. The creative class is what Richard Florida calls it. What I believe this image is telling you is that, you know, in a small way, this is not the, the equivalent of the Rocky Mountains, but basically a facility like this that proposes a different lifestyle can be part of a, a long equation of an attractor to retain people that have choices. And so these are, you know, people with beer who could be anywhere, right? And having a good time and making the place look, you know, better by their presence. So that is the 
kind of the end of a line of talk I wanted to give you. I want to show you two so that um, I want to show you two projects that are architecture projects that I feel like fulfill this mantra of sustainable urbanism, um, and they're they're sort of two um, uh, two basic ideas. Let's see. One is, this is called the Yanell House. It is in Chicago. It is our fourth lead platinum building. It is a zero net energy building. It's on a city block. And uh, you can see here it's got butterfly roofs, uh, which are designed to catch rainwater to put in a cistern to use to flush toilets. And uh, guess what? That's illegal. <laughs> you can't do that in Illinois. You can do it in 38 other states, but we, could, we ourselves could not do it. But, but what, I want to, what I want you to take from this is that this architecture project, you know, while being super zero net, green, whiz bang, cool stuff, uh, designed by my colleague Jonathan Boyer, is also a very good urban contributor. You know, that, back to that idea, every increment of the city we're trying to perfect every increment of the city. So this, this is now, according to local neighbors, a, a destination jog. People will choose their jogging route to go buy this house now, because it's that cool, right? That induces pedestrianism. So this idea of what makes a place walkable or induces people to uh, you know, jog or be physically active can be great architecture, right? So I think I'm missing one slide, but no matter, right? So here's another sort of urban scale project that I want to talk about. This is called Harper Court in Chicago. And it is very much a companion. Uh, it's just broken ground about two weeks ago, the last project that closed before we all completely, completely crashed, right? So we were the urban designer and master planner for this. It's going to be a million, million two square feet and three and a half acres. So it's really, really dense. But here's the street that I want to talk to you about. So, Normal, if you think about it, that circle was essentially, um, you know, going, it's about 300 feet long, it goes in a circle to treat the stormwater. So what we did for this project was straightened out the circle into a linear element, right? My knock on normal, I have very few bad things to say about it other than this, it uses um, grid electricity non-renewable electricity to pump water for the delight of humans and to cleanse it, which is a good thing. So we're, try, we're sort of trying to one-up ourselves with this project, and I'll just show you this detail. So what we proposed here at Harper Court is to take the normal circle, make it 300 feet long, put it on a long edge of a street here, and have it be only renewably powered. That is to say, it's designed for all the water to drain away if the sun isn't shining on the solar panels to power the pumps, or as a backup, humans are not actively pumping to get the water up. So we've sort of taken that whole non-renewable thing out of it and made it solely renewable. You want water? Cool, pump, get to work. So we'll see how this goes. So it's under construction, we expect it to be done uh, in a couple of years. I had my slides out of sequence here. So here is um, the, uh, the project I wanted to say is also a sustainable urbanist project. This is a new restaurant for a, a top celebrity chef in Chicago, a guy named Rick Bayless. Pretty good food, Mexican. Uh, Mexican. And so he designed a, he asked to design his new restaurant, Shoko. And we worked with him and got the kitchen in the window. And back to this idea, what does it take to make a place pedestrian friendly? What does it take to induce people to walk, to walk by your building? Not walk in general, but walk to your thing. Totally this, right? If you love churros, which are just amazing, you like chocolate, he makes chocolate and he makes churros in the window. You walk by and it's like you're just, you're slayed on the sidewalk. So you really want to be there, right? So I think of this as incredibly sustainable stuff, you know, and on the inside, of course, it's lovely and bright and, 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 and so on. Uh, but this idea that every increment of architecture perfects the city three notches up. Lee doesn't care whether your kitchen's visible in the neighborhood and people stand there agog on the sidewalk just looking and drooling at the food, right? I think it's a really good thing, but it is also, you know, perfecting the city. So that earlier slide was, uh, was I apologize, out of sequence. Here's a second slide of Yunel residents, and you can see here, you know, packing a lot in on a city lot, how it respects in some ways sort of urban, urban conditions, that is to say setbacks and heights and things like that, but also is completely, you know, non-traditional compared to the buildings up and down the block. They're classic sort of four squares and, uh, you know, simple stucco 
uh, stucco buildings. You can see the butterfly roofs also are used to screen and hide the uh, uh, solar panels. Both, we have both PV and solar hot water panels. Um, and I'll just mention as an aside, the one thing that we're innovating in this project, and we're on year two trying to prove out the net zero stuff, is it's really hard come February and March in Chicago to heat off geothermal. Because we have the solar hot water panels, we figured out this last season, the weekend in July and August, take that excess heat from the solar panels and charge the earth with it. So our geothermal wells and the soil around it, in July and August, we are adding heat to that that will sit there for six months. And it does not that, not that big a change of delta, but in February, we draw back on it to heat the house. And so that idea of annual storage of heat in, in the climate is just wild to me. So we're figuring this stuff out. But back to the idea of the jogging route, here's, here's Janelle two points of view, the one on the left and the one on the right. You know, charming, you know, you love a good architect designed house, but this one also tells a different story. There's something going on with those roofs, there's something about water, uh, and so on. So very, very excited about all that. So, Sustainable Urbanism, the book, right? It's, a, it, it's been a, a, heck of a heck of a fun thing to do. Andre Stuani, if you've ever heard of him, wrote my forward, wrote the forward for the book. Um, it is a bestseller, not to say it's Michael Crichton or anything like that. It's uh, sold 12,000 copies in you know, three years or so. Um, and it's just been translated into simplified Chinese. So we're very hopeful to the Chinese students who we met today, hopefully next summer, you'll be able to get a, a copy in Chinese. There are case studies in the book. The reason we wrote the book was we were interested, as you can see, the trajectory we're on was we want to apply sustainability at a higher scale. So we sort of put out this call for case studies across the world. We got 200 case studies and culled them down to 20 best, you know, best exemplars. The first question we had was to do something called sustainable urbanism, how much land do you need? What we first found, in this case, size doesn't matter. That you could be as small as four acres, 15, 120, thousands of acres, all of which exhibit the attributes of sustainable urbanism. I'm going to show you two that really, to me, stand out. And both are well published in certain circles. So if you've seen them before, I apologize. But they still impress me you know, after years of looking at them. First one is called Bed Z. <coughs> this is in a suburb south of London. Um, you can see here, it's, uh, this is a plan. The buildings are in color. There's sort of a ring road. It's kind of a dopey site plan. It kind of doesn't go anywhere. The connectivity is bad. But its achievement you know, is here. Uh, the target for it was to see if a development could be built in a developed country that would provide a high quality of life with a, within one ecological footprint. You know, the idea that the American lifestyle requires four planet Earths and we only have one. This is, let's live within one. So that was the target. And the other target was to do it at no cost premium. Here's what it ended up looking like. So these are essentially south-facing attached townhomes <coughs> with some spaces um, and then commercial spaces tucked, tucked underneath. Why do it that way? The residential does need heat through the year and the commercial tends to need cooling through the year. So why admit you know, natural light into it and with it the heat? <coughs> so here, here's Bed Zen. And you can see the other thing to say is the peacock colored, these little wind vanes, allow the units to be ventilated um, without use of mechanical anything. No electricity, no fans, it's just induced naturally. It's pretty cool. Um, here's the systems integration diagram that you'll often see you know, in projects like, like this. Um, Rainwater is caught on the roof, used to flush toilets. The excess uh, electricity generated from the PVs charges an electric vehicle. Uh, a biochip uh, district heating system you know, provides heat to the whole place, blah, blah, blah. The systems were laid out by AROP. You've heard of AROP. They're famous for this kind of stuff. Several of the systems were failures uh, and had to be redone, so we could talk about that in the Q&A or in the break or whatever. But what was powerful about this one is that it, you know, it had this goal of one ecological footprint. They bothered to measure everything, and they believe they got to 1.2 ecological footprints. From the UK average of like three and a half planets, they got to 1.2, right? And so the question was, how did they do it? How did they get from 3.5 to 1.2? And the finding was this, that 63% of the reduction of footprint 
came from phys physical design, solar panels, better insulation, better windows, things like that, things that architects uh, and engineers control. And 37% of the, the reduction came from changes in conduct. People just behaved differently once they got there. And that intrigues me. If I, you know, to the unemployed architects, and there may be a few of you in the audience, one of the things that I think is a complete frontier issue and suitable for this program at Lawrence University to take on is this question of designing conduct, right? Nobody knows how to do it. And you could completely start a new field uh, from scratch, in my opinion, to take that on. So project number one. Project number two, uh, case study, is Dockside Green. So that was four acres. This is 15 acres on the waterfront in Victoria, British Columbia. It's got a long list of attributes uh, as well. Um, the top on the list for me is this one. There's 26 buildings in this plan. We'll talk about the plan in a minute. But the proposal was that all of them would be lead platinum. And the developer, at the time the developer uh, proposed this, the world supply of lead platinum buildings was 24. So there's 24 in the world. One little project, 15 acres in the corner of Canada, proposes to double the world supply kind of that afternoon, right? Pretty cool, right? Well, Detroit certainly has 15 acres available a few places, and every municipality in the region probably has 15 acres. So every town in the region, I think, should do this. That's what I think should happen here, in my humble opinion. So uh, anyway, pretty, pretty cool stuff. So um, the other thing I failed to say is the developer proposed, uh, posted a $1 million forfeitable bond if he didn't get all 26 buildings platinum. And who was this guy? He was clearly an environmentalist nut job, right? He's an accountant. He's a bean counter. He said it was the safest money I've ever posted. We designed it from the get-go to reduce my first cost of construction and produce the lowest long-term operating cost. And so everything here is a district system. No building has a heating system, a cooling system. They treat wastewater on site, stormwater on site, share cars, the whole list, right? Here's what a street next to the development looks like. This is a waterfront condition, sounds like East Jefferson to me. Uh, and so here's a street, a complete street, and mixed use. They build boats on the ground floor and then live, live upstairs. But maybe the coolest thing, the story I love most about this is that in the middle of that site plan there's a water feature. Now, you know, the urbanists should have an issue with this. It's a big super block, the streets don't go through, but given that that's a sacrifice, what they got for it is they got this cool water feature in the middle, which is the polishing stage for their waste treatment system. So get this, they're selling townhouses. Actually, they get the highest dollar per square foot on the townhouses that face the waste treatment system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who did this? A wacky environmentalist, right? No, an accountant. Why? How did he do this? Water features, water, waterfront land always sells for the premium. So that all they had to do was be confident in the quality and odor-free nature of their waste treatment, and they're making more money at Bain Green. So isn't this a beautiful vision? I mean, can't, don't you want to just take this home and do it, right? So that's, that's the thought. So sustainable urbanism. So, uh, so bring, bring it on home. So if you don't read the book, and a lot of people who own it don't read it anyway, so I'll just tell you what it says. Um, the premise here is that sustainable urbanism will just be the norm in the world in 20 years. So that's, that's the premise, global domination by 2030. So how do you take over the world? Well, we have a three-step program to do just that. So the first one is to make this easy. Make all, this, all these fancy things we're talking about understood, tangible, and I go so far as to say, establish weights and measures to make them a commodity. Don't compel people involved in this to have to spend 20 years getting a PhD in some arcane corner of specialty to do this. No, make it something that a team can see the common opportunity and work together towards achieving that. So this is part of what the book did, tried to do, was to establish commodities and common concepts and goals. First one is called the sustainable neighborhood. Now planners, uh, urban planners will recognize this as an update on a really old planning diagram from Clarence Perry from 1929. And you know, there's the TOD circle too, the 10 minute walk, the uh, street network, the civic building set aside. Um, a variety of housing types in the neighborhood, and then in its day, this neighborhood was sized to support one elementary school. 
right? That's hard to do now, so we sort of adjusted it and said maybe an elementary school straddles two neighborhoods. But nonetheless, there's the basic Clarence Perry 1929 diagram. But it's been, uh, several things have been addressed and arguably fixed. So stormwater, we, want, we don't want our cities to sort of cause the degradation of land nearby because they're just putting all their stormwater in a pipe and eroding and flooding and degrading water quality. So how do you do that? A normal instinct in LEED would be to say, well, every building in this neighborhood should have its own bioswale and its own detention basin. And so let's spread the buildings further apart and make the neighborhood less dense so that we can do stormwater where rain falls. I say, no, that's a good idea. Do as much as you can, but don't de-densify. There is a benefit to having a compact neighborhood like this that we could talk about. Uh, you don't want to do that. What you do want to do is do as much as you can on the roofs and in the spaces that are available and then take the rest of it up at the edge of the neighborhood. Right? And this is just a, a riparian corridor of not putting your, your river in a pipe. Right? So Bob Gibbs, who here knows Bob Gibbs? Anybody? He's from Birmingham. He's you know, my hero. He's written a book, by the way, finally. He's threatened for 20 years. He claims he's written it. So, but he, I brought him a beer, got him drunk, and he agreed to put this in the book. Because for years I wanted to know, Bob, I, my, I'm obsessed with, you know, if I want a corner store, I want a main street, I want a sort of town center, how many households do I need to support that? I would say, Bob. And in a public lecture, I'd ask the question, you'd say, it always depends. And then at the bar, I got him one night, he said, a thousand. <laughs> so I said, would you put that in a book? He said, oh, you're going to write a book? Sure. You know, you write a book, I'll put it in it. And then years later, that happened. So, so here it is, that neighborhood, how should, how, what's the population of that neighborhood need to be? Depends on what amenities you want in it. A lot of people say, I love the convenience of having a quick trip to the store, the quart of milk, the, the quart of orange juice, the diaper, the, uh, the Band-Aid, whatever it is, uh, that's a good thing. And there's actual metrics now that tell us, guide us how to do that. And then you have uh, the next sort of scale up, scaling up sustainability is the corridor. Now this is a gnarly, I think to me right now my eyes, unattractive diagram, so I'm not going to let it be on the screen very long. It tries in essence in the footnotes that you can't read from anywhere to lay out this simple idea that land use and mobility are as a, as sort of glued together as your spine is to your flesh. Like you can't sort of have one without the other. So, so it tries to say in this corridor, what kind of development do I need? What density, mix of uses, and so on, do I need along that corridor to support different modes of transit? And so there are actual numbers, numbers and diversities and mixes and place types that if you build them, that transit naturally performs and sustains over time. Absent the land use, you can run a bus wherever the hell you want, we talked about it earlier today, it won't be sustainable. So that's what this is about. It's simple rules of thumb. Um, you also, I just want to talk about this too. In, a, in Detroit now, at a time when we are shrinking in population and have a lot of open space, this is Toledo. I think there's somebody here from Toledo in the class today. This is a master plan we did for Toledo in 2004 or five. And it looked at open space. And so you can see, and parks. So things that are green, are parks, and so you can see those colored. The things that are uh, white around them, the kind of little blobs, are the areas of the city of Toledo that are less than a five minute walk from a park, and then all the charcoal is those sections of, of Toledo that are more than five minute walk to a park. And you can see, to my eye, about half seems sort of un, un, underserved by parks. Now, how can I judge that a five minute walk is underserved? By this study from MIT, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that is from their real estate program, and Jun is a graduate of there, and I think he can speak to this, but it asks this simple question. How, what is the premium people pay for a house and lot, this is single family stuff, uh, for based on its distance to a park. So here's the distance, 100 feet, 300, 600, 1300 there, and then here's the sales premium. So if you're close to a park, 100 feet of a park, a 24% premium, right? If it gets down to a quarter, quarter mile, it's down to zero. So those whole sections of Toledo that have no parks are missing a lot of value. You can assess value both by the individual that's willing to pay the premium, the tax collector, uh, the neighbors that might uh, you know, benefit from it, and so on. So 
this is money left on the table. These are the kinds of the things that are in the book. So need for neighborhood developments is also part of that commodity developed jointly by these three groups. And um, you know, the prior slides also make the case that light bulb, Prius, green building, neighborhood, and corridor. We now can scale up sustainability. We can talk about them as tangibly as we can a light bulb. Oh, your neighborhood. Oh, a neighborhood's a half mile on the side. It's got a network of streets. It's got a mix of uses. It's got a diversity of housing types, et cetera, and the corridor uh, with it. Right? So second step to take over the world, roll back standards and subsidies. Now, what the heck do you mean by that? So sprawl, that auto-dependent thing that Detroit did, and Chicago did, and New York did, and Phoenix perfected, and Tucson perfected, uh, you know, it's this interlocking system of finance, land regulations, development norms, et cetera, et cetera, that meant that people made their best money quickly and easily by doing sprawl. Consuming cheap, you know, buying cheap farmland, holding it for a while, eventually viewing it as inventory to put large lot houses out on it. So, those rules perpetuate even after the markets change and we want something different. Now, the, the urban rural transect, if you haven't heard about it, is, is a tool to govern the simple idea that you don't want to regulate all types of land the same. This posits the idea that humans actually settle across a spectrum of place types from the very wilderness to the very downtown and then districts which are you know campuses and, and airports and things like that. So regulations need to be attuned to their place places. Years after we know we don't want that or we shouldn't be doing it however you want to view it. Anyway, so fixing the rules is part of it. And there's just this really simple idea that codes often require minimum amounts of things we want less of get this, we want less of it, but the code's asking not for a maximum, but a minimum. And here's my list, you know, off-street parking, wide streets, bright lights, building setbacks. These are things that are contrary, in my world, to what we want. So this is what we call the min-max project, which is go into your code and change the word minimum to maximum, and maximum to minimum, and see if anybody notices, right? So <laughs> don't change the numbers, don't fight about the numbers. Just, you know, it's four per thousand, five per thousand, that's cool, you know. The numbers didn't change, it's just the word, right? And then here's the opposite, things that set maximums, uh, you know, on things we want more of, and here we are, here we are there. And then the sort of the fine, the next level down in terms of controls and sustainable codes is this idea that you can, you can zone things through FAR, you can zone things through design guidelines, or you can zone things through form-based codes, which are, second time I've mentioned it in this talk, I think a really cool tool that if it isn't taught at the school, really ought to be by next, by next time I'm here, whenever that is. Um, and then this, this issue that lead ND, which we, we will talk about only slightly, um, is illegal across the country. So when we did the Chicago Center for Green Technology, there, we had two permitting issues with the building. And I'll tell you what they were. One was waterless urinals. And waterless urinals, the issue there was that the plumbers union in Chicago said, we are drawing a line in the sand. We're not letting this ever happen here. Why? Because there's no plumbing. And there's no jobs. So, so the negotiation was about, well, could we plumb it and install it? and leave dead end the pipes in the wall. <laughs> and they said no to that. And they were smart. And why, why would you say no to that? He said, well, that's the first step. Because you're going to start them, they're going to gain market acceptance, and then somebody will say, what's with the pipes? You know, get rid of the pipes and the jobs will go away. So they, in fact, I was, I had a stack of, I thought it was about public health and, you know, flies and I don't know what. So I had a big stack of things. So two doctors standing by on the phone and face to face with the chief plumbing inspector who was also the head of the plumbers union. He said, you know, over my dead body. So we didn't get that. And then the second one was our geothermal system, which we just made the mistake of calling, uh, instead of calling them shafts, you know, because they drill a deep shaft. So we called them wells. And that was a big mistake, because it ended up at the water board, and they thought we were trying to you know, install a competing potable water system to the city water system. So we got corrected on that. But those were two small, fairly small technical issues with you know, a pretty push in the, push in the limits uh, green building. Lead ND violates basic subdivision, basic zoning. If you pull out wherever you live, 
um, pull out your zoning code, get online, they're all online, and look and see the lead ND criteria if you want to look that up and compare it and you'll find out it's legal. So there's a three step process, make it legal, make it easy, and I say over time, just require the darn thing because this is, it, it solves so many problems. So step three, change the local thinking, practice, and culture. And of the three, this is the longest as you might imagine. So, uh, you know, can we technically do all the things we're talking about? Absolutely. There's no inventions required. Of course, in, you know, innovations will continue, technology will get better, but we don't really need that. Our barriers are all in our heads, honestly, in terms of what we want to spend our how money on and how the lifestyle we want to lead. I show this picture to say this might have been the American dream home circa, I don't know, 1988 or 1993 or something, you know, called the McMansion pretty much, you know, triple, triple garage door, etc., etc. A dinosaur. This house is a dinosaur. Nobody wants it. The demographics are going to smaller families. No one wants to maintain it, heat it, buy it, pay it off, anything like that. So I show you this little transformation to get you visualizing, <laughs> which is... This may be what we need to do with this house. So let's go back. This was kind of fun, right? How many families live there now? One. How many families could live there? Three. Three. Look here. There's a new door. The third garage space is now the entry to an apartment unit. You go in the door, there's two, uh, two units, a left and a right. So it's like, you know, townhouses, a pair of them, and then the third unit sort of straddles, saddles over the garage. There's horses, right? horses. Fixing salads over here. Now, again, back to this idea of rules and regulations. Now, a subdivision is one of the most tightly controlled constructions of human beings, right? Typically, a subdivision ordinance would not allow you to put the solar panels, the wind turbines. You're often required to have Kentucky bluegrass by homeowners association rules in your front yard. So the garden, the sign would be considered a commercial sign and exempt, the horse would be exempt, the multiple dwelling units exempt. So this might be the thing we absolutely need to do to make that obsolete housing type uh, provide utility and affordable housing and maybe the, the kid that goes away to college and comes home needs their own you know, way to come and go and so on. This is, this is resilient, this is resilient. And it's highly illegal all across the country. So that challenges us to think about what we want so, and rules and so on. So, um, this next thing, this is about changing culture. So this I say with great affection to my brethren and sister in, in Detroit. But in doing the book, we figured out this one statistic that seems to hold up, that on average by age 25, uh, and the average American has spent one year in a car. One year. Now, Typically, the car is running also all that time, I should say. Um, it's not you're sitting there and the windows are rolled up and it's a sunny day and you're dying or something like that. You're going somewhere, the car motor is running. So that's quite a lot of time. And uh, to visualize, oh, my newborn, I can't wait till their year is up. You know, they, they can be back out in, you know, in uh, captivity, whatever, out of their captivity. So, so driving, this is a big deal. I was, um, we have issues with it. So, you know, these are 2005 numbers, but you, you respect them for being damn close to where we are today. The average American drives 10,000 miles a year. The average American family drives virtually once around the planet every year, right? So, I grew up in Detroit. We would, there would be seven of us, we'd have seven cars. And we'd decide where you want to go based on cuisine. And so it was not uncommon for that to be a 15 or 20 mile drive to get to pizza and back, right? In Chicago, we absolutely walk to where we go. It's just the way the city's laid out, it's the, the culture. So, so I'm, I'm just saying this is, this is quite a lot. This, um, this, this uh, footnote, what do you call it? Caption, sorry, is a, is a good one. Societal addictions are easier to spot in cultures other than one's own. So, so I've never been to an opium den, and based on this picture, I'm not actually that interested. Um, you know, maybe the first few minutes would be kind of high, but then it just looks like a drag. So, but anyway, these people are addicted. These people are totally addicted, you know, as, as are we to lots of things. Chief amongst them driving. So, you know, and these are challenges. I don't, I'm not 
telling you something you don't already know. This is a map of how much Americans have driven over the decades. And so, you know, in 1930, average American drove 1,000 miles, 1970, 4,000, 2,000, it was 8,000, and, you know, looking, aiming way up, right? The trajectory was way up. So, back when the book came out, we proposed this idea of what if by 2030 we set ourselves a target, intellectual target, not a binding mandate target, that said, could we by 2030 somehow rejigger things or rethink how we live and so on, so that we drove as much as we did in 1970? That was the vision. So, you know, basically that this would be symmetrical. Watch this curve. This, this is a laugh line, right? Like, humans have never changed their conduct that fast for anything. Abatement of smoking, no. Um, you know, anything, anything, anything. So this is a kind of preposterous proposition, right? But it would be a good one if we could do it, right? But what I would say about it, what it reveals to me is this. So, growing up in Detroit, this is the car I wish our family had. We never had this. This is a those of a certain age, a Plymouth Barracuda. Really cool car. What was cool about it? You could sleep in back, and you could have like sleep, kids would always get the sleeping bags, and you could watch the stars and sleep in back. It was really, really cool. What was different then, as compared to today, was that the relationship between us and the car was one of pleasure. So in that time, and those of us remember this, parents would always say, kids, get in the car, we're going for a drive and this is going to be fun. And the kids would go, oh, well, I don't want to go. But we would go. And the parents clearly enjoyed the time in the car as a delightful thing to do. This expression stopped being used in America about 1990, right? There was no ever fun ride in a car, right? It stopped being true. I mean, we were conceived in cars. We had a good time in cars. Detroit, <laughs> Detroit we should be proud of how much fun we had in a car. But my point to you, the kind of cultural switch to consider is, I would love to have a life where I could go back in time and rent a, a Barracuda or a Mini Cooper or a smart car or a Prius on demand, right? I'd love to do that on occasion, but do I want to be dependent on that? Absolutely not. And so the difference is joy and pleasure versus dependence, right? Think of those opium addicts when we look at the car. So, we love cars, we just don't want to be dependent on them. So, and then how does this translate into land use? A lot of things that planners can do to add value is to enable things to become something else in the future. So here's a dumb big box store, right? Generally speaking, they don't migrate or evolve to become anything else, but they could. You could insist that the plan be laid out as though future streets were gonna come. You could insist on inline retail stores so it's not just the big box that's getting all the money, that small locally owned businesses get some. You could call these street trees, <coughs> excuse me, install street trees, which generally speaking are banned by the fire marshal who considers this, what do they call it, the fire lane, right? You've seen those signs like, don't park here, fire lane, right? So you can't legally have street trees there because it's a fire lane. You know, if it's, if it's a building on a regular street, it's called a street. <laughs> and you can put whatever you want there. But this is a fire lane. So how can that fire lane transform to become a street? And then over time, that it evolves. And the parking lot is a, seen as a future development site. And it can intensify if the economics justify. <coughs> so further to changing the culture, there's this one. The idea that in a couple of years there will be an, either an app for that or your Facebook page will have a little thermometer that says, drives a lot, drives a little, it's complicated, whatever, you know, something like that. <laughs> um, but that your sex appeal would be inversely proportionate to the amount of time you spend in a car. And I will say that the 20 somethings that I know, the kids in my office and so on, without going through the sort of artificiality of a cartoon like this, Register something like that. Like people are cool that kind of live the, the low impact lifestyle uh, in some ways than, than others. So this is a beautiful picture, by the way, to me. Excuse me, to me. That is a, a box of sustainable urbanism books. Really, it's a pretty, it smells good. I kind of can spend a few minutes sort of lounging around, enjoying it. Really fun. Um, and if you, um, if we, you know, for people that get the book, we also have these perks. This button. Um, Oops, whoops, sorry. This button. 
uh, which, you know, Detroit, you're missing something. I'm just saying, you know, the rest of the country is wearing this button and walking around smiling. So, you know, <laughs> consider it. But is, doesn't that sort of change your mindset, like what's fun, where do I want to be, and so on and so on. Um, and then this, you know, the bumper sticker, your, your SUV makes you look fat. Um, again, an attempt to um, humor, uh, uh, highlight, embarrass, whatever, whatever. So you can sort of see what we're talking about here. So in the end, this is, you know, about putting out there a new vision, changing our culture, changing the things we value. In conclusion, we've got the technical moxie to do zero net buildings. We've got the technical know-how to do zero net neighborhoods. We have barriers in the form of, you know, siloization, specialization amongst professions, the failure of there being an authority that can say, do it here, right? Those are the barriers. But the biggest barrier I contend is the barrier of imagination and the barrier of vision and the barrier of leadership. And so those of you who are students especially, this is the take home message, become leaders, absolutely become leaders. Advocate, become effective <coughs> spokespeople. Advocate with facts, with statistics that support your position so that they are rock solid and bomb proof. You cannot just assert things that you like or you think are fun. Have your numbers lined up to justify what you're doing. And, and if you do that, we need, we need hundreds and thousands of you and that you'll be well positioned, I think, in the job market. So even though this picture isn't a US picture, this is Amsterdam, which is you know, a pretty cool place too. Um, you know, it is that kind of thing. Like who wouldn't like one of these near their house? Like, pretty cool, right? You'd go there, you'd hang out. You know, this is sort of Starbucks on the street and so on. So anyway, I'll leave you with this idea that our biggest challenge is leadership and vision. And uh, I think we'll do some Q&A, is that right? Thank you very much for listening, thank you. Thank you, we do have time hopefully for, uh, for a few questions. Any questions? I do not see a question. There's one over there. Oh, okay. Question. Yeah. At a house in Chicago, you had, <laughs> had a house in Chicago, you had, had a lot of people on notice. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so uh, the question is the Yanel house that I showed you has 53% glazing. 53% of the walls are glazed. Um, this was designed by my uh, partner, Jonathan Boyer, and we fight about these things. So I think the optimal range of glass for that is in the 30s, you know, 30, 35, 38, something like that. So it's way over glazed to my way of thinking. So, um, so the answer is the client liked that and had the means, in this case, to just buy enough renewable energy systems to overpower, you know, to me, excess glass. Now, the, all the glazing is triple glazed, actually triple glazed. Um, the envelope is like super everything, right? The envelope is great. The glass is obviously the weak link, and the fact that we have so much of it is a super weak link. So if I had designed it, it would have had 10 to 15 percent less glass, but it's, it's lovely. It's like being outdoors. It really is. But it, I was going to say one other thing. It perpetuates uh, the, you know, I love the house. I love the work that was done. It is a modern landmark. It's great. But there's this interesting story uh, from the inside workings of LEED from a couple years ago that's worth repeating. So, you know, LEED struggles, USGBC struggles with LEED on how, uh, with what um, aggressiveness to increase its standards, like especially for energy efficiency. So there's this whole, you know, all the people that say, we've got to go much faster, much more quickly, all this stuff to be aggressive in energy. And USGBC says, well, we have people that are just learning lead. We can't sort of change it on them tomorrow to double what they had to do. So there's this tension. But lead was debating, USGBC was debating increasing uh, the, the reference it did in, in ASHRAE. And a large developer based in Houston, I was there two weeks ago and heard this story again, lobbied them and said, we only do glass box office buildings. And if you adopt this new level of ASHRAE, we won't be able to certify at all under lead. And so we'll drop out. So don't do it. So it was interesting, this sort of the 
willingness to fight to keep a modernist glass box transparency architecture when in truth as the you know the energy requirements ratchet up that will be increasingly suboptimal so and the glass box will never make it so I ask the question if if historical styles might just sort of we might recapitulate them right because there's these studies that suggest buildings from the 20s and 30s do still pretty well right skinny floor plate good natural lighting a fair amount of solid wall to keep the heat in and the cool out, you know, like that. So, thank you. Four answers. Question back there. I know that most of your lead programs are in North America. Yes. Have you ever taken it to a third world country, tropical, maybe? Even, uh, India, even India would be so far. Okay, how about Nigeria? Nigeria sounds good. Okay, okay, yeah, we, I don't have it to show you, but yeah, we did um, a project in, uh, outside of Lagos, in Lucky State, it's called, um, and that was a, a real eye-opener. We were invited by a Chicago developer, a friend of mine, who is also Nigerian, who brought us there. The Chinese are all over Africa. They've, they're making alliances to um, exchange, essentially, access to uh, resources uh, in exchange for land and labor, and so they had a contract with the government for like control of all this land and did a terrible job just thoughtlessly sort of planning it and clearing the jungle and all this sort of stuff so we should talk after because that's a long story but did you have a specific you wanted to well I, I'm more into the reducing of poverty and housing yeah because it only breeds more diseases yes and uh, being a person from Jamaica I was thinking of uh, improving the, the lot of people in their housing situation. Yeah. Because it only decreases the educational values. Yeah. I, I mean, it might sound like a long thing, but it, improper housing affects education, health, and everything. Um, we're going out drinking after this, so I think you're going to have to join us. But um, I did did uh, did a seminar in Jamaica, in Kingston, with the Prime Minister, not the current one, but the previous one. So we, we could have a lot to talk about. Yeah. There go. There's one more question here, and then we'll and then we'll take it outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe 14 years or 12 plus years that you've been doing sustainable design, programming, buildings, neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. Have you done any long-term monitoring of, of your Structures, buildings to actually accumulate data, data to help sell to the next project. Yeah. As that, if you're thought about going around and doing a lecture series to professionals such as our tech set engineers to help sell the idea to the client. Yeah. The biggest hurdle that I find is financial. Yeah. So every, everybody heard the two part question, which is um, do, do we monitor the actual performance once it's built? And the secondly is sort of ideas on overcoming financing barriers. So let me take the first one. Um, the answer is a lot of our buildings are on these various national studies. I, don't, I forget who funds them, USDOE, you probably know. Um, and they come in and do these reports. And uh, I will just, you know, air some dirty laundry on us. Chicago Center for Green Technology is not doing as well as it was modeled to do. The, uh, the one I didn't show, Christy Weber Landscapes, was projected to be 57% better than the code at that time and is meeting the number. And that, but that took like two or three commissionings and recommissionings. Um, and CCDT, the issue with it is we did, uh, we did lighting controls Again, in 1999 and 2000, they were very much kind of cobbled together from off-the-shelf components. And there were, and it, I don't think it, the light sensors quite did what they were supposed to do. So the lights were on a lot. The air conditioning was compensating for the presence of the lights that didn't need to be on. I think that's a lot of the, the sort of shortcomings there. Um, so the answer is we don't, but others do. Uh, but that's a really good thing because there's also we've seen the commissioning studies that the actual performance is you know 50 percent to 200 percent of what you thought it was going to be. So that's that's a big issue. Um, and then the second one, the cost. Um, wow. Uh, you know I think that you know the way I people come to us because they're interested in this and they want to be led to a better outcome than they would without us, right? So that's kind of why they're there. So given that context. We have a pretty good, pretty good luck on selling people on a lot of, a uh, lot of the basic measures. Um, even environmental groups, who are a chunk of our clients, we of, often offer like a basic, medium, and high. And the high scares them into doing the medium. 
that's what I've found. So, in fact, there's great consumer research on this. As soon as you add another premium product, you can take away the one on the bottom and they'll pick the one in the middle. You add two at the top, they'll pick the one in the middle. Just keep, keep, and it just moves them up. So, A, B, C, they pick B. So, design your B really well, because that's the one you want them to pick. So, um, but you'd be surprised, you know, this, this whole, uh, this is not your question. I just want to say this and this will be the last thing we'll go drinking or whatever, but the, um, this idea, it, what intrigues me, those of us who got plan, uh, architecture degrees in the physical design of buildings, you know, that's what I studied twice. This whole idea of conduct, designing conduct, designing decisions, marketing, salesmanship, um, all that sort of stuff, I think is like, at the center of what I do, more so than technical skills. I mean, we've got the technical skills, yes. Many people in this audience do, yes, but that ain't necessarily getting it done. It's this other thing. It's about leadership and connecting and making the case. So, you know, I've said it all day to the students, but absolutely become leaders, become persuasive, figure out who the leader in the room is, buttonhole him, sit next to him at dinner, buy him a drink, put your arm around him, kiss him, make him vote for your project, whatever it is. But, you know, you don't want to do the best idea that sits on the shelf. You really don't. We don't have the time for that. You don't, shouldn't be your aspiration. You should propose the best thing and have it implemented. That's, that's my closing thing. So, thanks for letting me so, riff off your so, so question. I, I took a bottom well, line out of that. It involves drinking. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Was there one? Did, did, you okay. the one So um, I'm not the expert on this, but I can point you to a resource that's pretty good. So the client, the excuse me, the, this is the BEDZ project. The uh, developer is a not-for-profit called BioRegional. If you go on their website, you'll get a whole thing. So the result of that is that they have gone and specialized as a not-for-profit in what they call uh, uh, environmental concierge, essentially all of the soft architecture of the place and how it's managed to induce that better conduct. And so they now you can hire them to go to your neighborhood or your building to get similar results. And so they have a 10-step thing and it's pretty comprehensive. Is that but how different is the guidance? How is the conduct? Is it different? Is it different? I mean, what, what do they do differently? They do. In what? How do they do? Well, the, I can give you anecdotes. I'll just say that it's the, the part that's quantified is 37% of the reduction of an ecological footprint or harm or burden, whatever, comes from changes of conduct. It's a lot of things. So uh, it is working at home that there's one for you. The fact that you can actually, you know, there's commercial space and residential space in the same building or on the same block. So if you have a business rent here, you won't have to go anywhere. Um, there's a lot of sharing activities that go on. I don't know, you know, trust me, there's a website. And uh, you've asked me a great question. It'll go into the next edition of the book, by the way. I, I promise to be better prepared in a couple of years. So. Very good. Well, okay. uh, this brings us to the end of tonight's session, but before we go, uh, let me just remind everyone that uh, November 17th is our next lecture. Evan Roth uh, will be here. Uh, he was trained initially as an, as an architect, uh, but then went to uh, Parsons, the New School of Design, where he currently also teaches, and he's involved in interaction art, uh, digital art, and, and a whole genre of, of arts. Uh, so we, we think it'll be very entertaining. That's uh, November 17th, same time, same place. Um, for those of you that are particularly from the profession, uh, if you need a, a poster, you can, you can get our things on uh, uh, about the, the program online, but if you want a poster to hang up in your office, uh, just give us your card and we'll make sure to mail one out to you. Uh, we don't want to print too much paper, but uh, but uh, sometimes it's good for mass distribution to put it on a poster in your office. Uh, yes? Um, Glenn, thanks for recognizing me. I just wanted to say thank you, Doug. Hey, Bob. It's great to see you again and let everyone know that in the spring, uh, Doug doesn't even know this yet, but we're bringing him back <laughs> uh, for another uh, forum, day long forum on the need for neighborhood development with the planners and the development community. And 
And and that and that uh, that workshop will will occur here uh, in the spring on a Friday, right? I believe, isn't that the plan? Yes. More more to more to come. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much, Doug. We really appreciate it.